I'm going to be talking to Bentley Allen, who is the resident fellow for green industrial policy at the Transition Accelerator, about a new report that outlines a roadmap for the, to accelerate Canada's battery metals industry to meet growing EV demand. So welcome to the interview, Bentley. Thank you so much, Mark. It's great to be back on your show. Thank you for covering the report. Well, good to have you here. Now, it's become painfully obvious to me in the last year that the global auto industry has just gone in all in on electric. And we, we added up the amount of capital uh, between that will be invested in switching from internal combustion engines to electric by 2026. And just for the major automakers, I think it was like $341 billion. Didn't include China, didn't include India, right. and so on. All of those vehicles are going to need batteries. And all of them are going to need materials like lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, and what have you. And apparently, we said this over and over again, Canada is well positioned to supply those materials and possibly some of the battery manufacturing. What's holding us back? Well, I, on the one hand, I would say that there's a lot of activity already. There's a lot of action in this space. The government, especially I said, has done a really good job of getting out there and securing uh, strong investments um, on the downstream side of the supply chain. And in a highly competitive environment, they've been able to get um, you know, battery factory, two cathode factories, um, and a bunch of investments from the automotive OEMs that are already located here in Canada. So I think they've done a good job. And I think that, that a lot of kudos has to go to the team at I said. Um, as well as their counterparts across other ministries for the work that they've done. So we really have a made in Canada supply chain for battery metals coming into view. Um, and now we have a $3.8 billion critical minerals fund, which is heading upstream uh, in order to bring the mining online that would be needed in order to feed into those uh, downstream plants. Now, the first strategic question is, are we sure that the Canadian feed is gonna be used for those downstream plants? A couple months ago, there was an announcement from Ford, which suggested that they were going to be using cattle, which is you know the large Chinese um, battery manufacturer, to fulfill the demand for for their EVs that will be produced in North America, um, and that's a that structural problem whereby China is controlling huge chunks of the supply chain is really the elephant in the room as soon as you start to look at the battery metals uh, profile. So countries like Canada that want to break into the space have some major global competition to deal with. But um, outside of that downstream and that upstream focus, I, I feel that what Canada really needs in the long run and what the report really uh, emphasizes is the importance of what I call the midstream, which is the chemical production phase in between mining and automotive uh, battery production, where the metals are actually turned into battery grade material. This is a key value added piece of the supply chain and it's an area where Canada has very little capacity. In fact, North America and Europe as a whole has very little capacity and it's where I think we should focus some efforts. Is it fair to say then that the uh, the advantage that China has is in part uh, because they have a well developed uh, midstream of the their supply chain? That's exactly right. So they will go around and secure offtake agreements for mines all over the world, and they'll process those those minerals in China. Um, and we see this in Australia and Canada, which have been kind of turned into, you know. The hinterlands they've been turned into the place where the resources come from um, rather than the places where the value is really added to that and that's a structural weakness in the canadian economy uh when i was previously on your episode we talked about this exact structural weakness which is that canada tends to be a resource country rather than an, an adder of manufacturing value added and when we do do lots of manufacturing value added such as in the automotive sector it's only because we continue to provide strong subsidies and fiscal incentives to those downstream firms to keep them here basically. So is it the case that Canada has none of uh, has no midstream capacity or are we just limited midstream capacity and it doesn't look like we have a strategy to increase it at or expand it at the rate that it needs to? It's more the latter. So there is actually a really exciting announcement that has flown below the radar in the Canadian press, which is that uh, Nano One, which is a startup um, in British Columbia uh, headquartered in Burnaby, uh, just announced that it was buying the battery business of Johnson Matthey. Johnson Matthey is a large global chemical uh, company, just like BASF and others that are positioned in the battery space. And they had an LFP, a lithium iron phosphate facility in Quebec that they were winding down and looking for uh, to sell off. And there was a number of global bidders uh, for that facility and Nano One, the Canadian firm, won that. And that's really exciting news because what it means is that Nano One will use their process, which is an innovative science-based chemical process 
uh, to, to reinvigorate LFP production in Quebec. And that's a really exciting development. And it shows that we have nascent capacity and it kind of creates a blueprint for leveraging existing expertise, especially in lithium iron phosphate, which actually was commercialized first in, in the, actually the lithium battery was first commercialized by Molly Cell in 1979 in, um, in British Columbia. And LFP was first developed uh, as a particular chemistry for, for EVs um, by a, a consortium in Quebec. And then actually that was licensed for free to China, which they then built into a global leading industry, LFP industry, that now, um, you know, North American auto manufacturers are trying to wrestle back from China. So it's actually a really interesting story of the West sitting on its hands while Chinese industrial strategy scooped up global market share and IP and licensing rights all across the country to position itself as a real strong uh, holder of, of the position in global supply chains. Now is, uh, so you publish a roadmap. Uh, does the roadmap include uh, Canadian companies uh, expanding in the midstream, or is this a case again of where, you know, Canada is a small open economy, never has the amount of capital and never doesn't have the expertise and, and the, you know, the, the businesses that, uh, that are required. What, what are we looking at here? Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, FDI is an important piece of the Canadian economy, and we're not going to live without uh, foreign companies making strong investments in facilities and bringing their expertise here to Canada. But the thesis of the report and of all of my work is that we're not going to uh, resolve the long-term structural um, problems in the Canadian economy if we don't build homegrown capacity, which is to say if we don't figure out how to scale Canadian firms and do Canadian innovation and Canadian scaling and Canadian commercialization here in Canada. If we can't solve um, what we might think of as being technology readiness levels, you know, five to nine. If we can't solve that here in Canada, um, then we're going to continue to be a branch plant for, for, for other countries. Um, and so the report really tries to explain how would we actually build some homegrown capacity in the supply chain? How do we, A, learn from those foreign investments to support domestic capacity? And secondly, how can we bring along the Canadian firms and the junior miners and grow them into real players in this space? And it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to grow junior miners because metallurgy is really complicated. Um, and it's really hard to um, scale startups like Nano One because of the weak financing community and the weak financing traditions that we have here in the United in, in Canada, um, and tackling that is a, is a key part of that. Well, now that leads me to my next question. I mean, uh, uh, many of the governments, provincial governments in Canada, have said we have critical minerals uh, within our provincial boundaries that we and so we we see this opportunity and we want to exploit this opportunity. So does that mean like say Alberta, which recently has been talking about this quite a lot. Uh, so Alberta uh, can uh, put in place the regulatory framework. It can provide financial support, get the mining up and going. But then what does it do? Does, is, is, are we in a situation then where, you know, where all of that is gonna be shift up, shipped up to Quebec or will provincial government, will provinces develop their own midstream uh, plants to process the minerals that they mine within their borders. Yeah, well, lithium is an interesting case because that would be another place where I think we have nascent midstream capacity, which is to say that there are a number of startups in lithium that um, you would think of as doing both mining and the chemical processing because they're going to produce lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide, which is functionally battery grade at the end of the day. So they're basically combining the mining and the midstream together into one phase. And so Alberta's major play is, is in that, I would say. Um, and that means that the question is where that, that material is then gonna go. And of course they could sell it into a global market as long as they could get a green corridor from the Alberta heartland uh, to the coast or to the United States. Um, there's a transportation infrastructure background problem here, right? But there's also a clean power problem because lithium extraction, which is what these firms in Alberta do need clean power. So they need, you know, they need basically clean electrons in order to do what they're going to do. Uh, I think there's an interesting question as to how the, those ecosystems develop. And the report doesn't try to tackle those directly, but certainly the conversations around the report have really focused on what would the regional structure of the country look like. And what I do say in the report is that there's an opportunity for Alberta to link together with BC to feed into what I call a Cascadia to Fremont corridor. 
um, which would maybe look a little bit like the corridor that developed around, you know, from Detroit all the way down the Mississippi to Tennessee, where there's now a lot of automotive manufacturing all the way up and down the corridor. We have an opportunity in the West, I think, to, to really think about how we could create an analogous situation. And Alberta could feed into that. Um, but in the short run, it certainly looks like anything useful is going to go to Quebec. And the reason is because Quebec had a strategy. They had a critical mineral strategy in 2018. Propulsion Quebec did a, did a battery strategy for them in 2019 with a clear action plan to it. And then they empowered Investissement Quebec to go out, hire really good people who take an active role in fixing holes in the supply chain, as opposed to the way that Canadian policy normally does things, which is have a passive application-based system where the firms come to the come to the government with their own ideas. And then we end up with a patchwork that doesn't actually activate the entire supply chain, leaves some firms in weak positions, others in monopoly positions, and doesn't actually think about the ecosystem as a whole. So the report again, really pushes on this and says, wait a minute, we need an active approach. We need our funding mechanisms to be key to roadmaps. We can't just leave our funding mechanisms passive. We have to get active in the same way that the Quebec government has. Um, and the institutions in Quebec, I think it's really important to mention are independent ones. Propulsion and Investissement Quebec are kind of freed from the electoral play of that province. And therefore they have the ability to make smart investments as opposed to politically expedient ones. Now, um, the federal government has made money available for this kind of invest or support for this kind of in industry. I think this is, it would be, uh, uh, it wouldn't be a stretch to say that the federal government has exactly this kind of development in mind. And I know from contacts in Alberta that there is uh, lots of money chasing, you know, uh, clean tech projects like, like lithium. Mm -hmm. Are, even though that may be the case, are we still going to be short of capital get this, to get this done at scale? I think it's really important that both the government and private industry um, pool their capital. I think that's a really important thing that needs to be done. We need to find ways to get cooperation between public and private capital. And so the report, again, like the previous report I discussed on your show, um, really emphasizes the importance of public, private, and Indigenous partnerships, because Indigenous communities both have um, the rights over many of the resources that we would like to develop um, for the EV supply chain, um, but they also have capital that can be effectively deployed uh, to these ends. Um, but in order to take advantage of, of those potential opportunities with Indigenous communities, we need to sort of realize that the history of industrial strategy in this country is a history of colonial violence, and we have to reckon with that before we can move forward. But public, private, and Indigenous finance need to uh, work together. Okay, so we've talked a lot about uh, number of pieces of the roadmap. Is there anything we, we've missed? Anything that needs to be, that we sh have, should have talked about, but haven't? Yeah, the key top line um, item that we haven't talked about so far is that we need an integrated supply chain that suits Canadian needs. And to do this in the report, we started to sketch what I call metals strategies, which is to say that we can create an abstract national strategy, but what we really mean is how do we get nickel specifically from the mine to a, a cathode, to, to a battery? How do we get lithium? How do we get uh, cobalt? How do we get manganese? And all of these are kind of different. Um, they all have kind of different metallurgical processes. Graphite is not analogous to nickel at all. And so when you're making a strategy, you actually need to get into how are these minerals actually processed? I need to think at that level of detail. So the report does get down to that level of detail in the case of graphite, lithium, uh, nic nickel, and rare earths. Um, because if we're going to figure out the midstream, we have to figure out the midstream specifically for each of these, which are very different. Um, so what I want to say there is that if we just let firms like Glencore and Valet, the, the big global mining folks, create the supply chain, they'll create it in ways that give them international flexibility and that maximize their ability as basically international commodities traders. Um, so in Long Harbor, the nickel is turned into mat, which is kind of a metal really. And it's not a very good intermediate if what you're trying to do is make batteries because you have to decompose the metal before you then turn it into cathode. So you basically have added additional steps that are expensive and that are not necessary in order to, to, to get the metal to cathode. Instead, it would be much better to go to what's called MHP or, or mixed hydroxide and uh, precipitate. And, and that is a more efficient route that's being uh, that's really emerging as the core of a global supply chain. But those firms have no necessary interest in investing in MHP because they haven't really gotten super involved in the car industry yet. But again, metallurgy is tough. And so are they just going to jump in? Probably not because those big uh, miners have been burned. So what we need is a national strategy that incentivizes the creation of a national supply chain 
with certain pieces that we know are basically going to be part of it. And once you get into the chemistry of each specific metal, you start to see, oh, there are some real top line items that we're missing here. And that it's not clear where the investment is going to come from. And we need to spin up firms to do this if the big players are not willing to, or we need to create joint ventures between junior miners, universities, and those big players in order to get the metallurgy right. And we need to start working on that kind of stuff. Uh, right now. So creating an integrated supply chain is really important. And it requires, again, the kind of public-private partnership that, that I'm underlining throughout the report. Final question, Bedley. Are you confident that the, uh, the governments involved and the industry players involved get it and that they're going, we're going to do things a little differently this time around and actually uh, deliberately build a an integrated the integrated supply chain that is required here i think that i think lots of people get it i really do i, I talked to lots of folks across ministries in the department uh, in, the, in the canadian government i talked to folks across industry both you know in the more junior and, and startup level and the more um, senior level and i think everybody gets it i think what we're missing is a plan and we're, we're missing clear targets and we're missing clear consistent public leadership so the other thing that the report does is lay out some targets. It says we need 1.3 million vehicles by 2030. That means we need 100 gigawatts of battery power. And therefore, we need X amount of investment. We need X number of facilities for the cathode, for the mining, in order to bring that 100 gigawatts online. So we need that kind of public infrastructure. And we really need that leadership to come from the government. So I think folks get it. I just think that, they, that the government needs to be a little more bold and a little more public with what exactly is happening if we're going to actually be successful. Bentley, uh, thank you for your insights. Always appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here.